All right. So we're going to, how beautiful is it that we're talking about unity at a time like this? I have never been more convinced that God led me to a place of preaching and teaching than I have been during this COVID and now, and now uh, protest season. Never been more convinced. Because every time I look at the scripture, I'm like, Lord, I don't have to change the subject. I can just stay right here where we are and we can get where we need to go together. This was the Lord's doing in my life and it's marvelous in our eyes. And so I'm also doing a thing that maybe has been a little different. Actually, I did it with Matthew. I sort of, I, I, do, I do repetitive progressive preaching. That is, I give you last week's sermon a little bit and then go further. Then next week, I'll give you this week's and go further. And uh, I don't know, we'll finish. I'm, I feel certain we'll finish Ephesians in a few more months. Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be on my lips. I was, I, I've been able to bless the Lord at the death of my sister and at the, and at the funeral and declare Jesus over my family. We stayed for two weeks and gathered together and celebrated my mother's 90th birthday. Yeah. And uh, I've confessed openly. I'll confess it to you. This is the second time in my life that I just want to go home and take care of my mother. But I'm going to man my post. But when I need to go, I'm going to get up and leave. Hallelujah. That's what I'm going to do. And uh, I also got to preach in Brandon at the Point Church where Jim Taylor, my friend, is the pastor. So I did that last week. They'll never be the same. Y'all know all of my, all of my you can't get this stuff anywhere moments. I gave them, I gave them all of them in one sermon. <laughs> so it was fun. I love Jim. Uh, Jim's wife is battling with cancer. There's a few other things going on uh, family-wise. Uh, Betty Newman is recovering from a, a really serious back surgery. And it's, it's one of those that Betty's always like has these, has these surgeries and then she just comes back and you're like, what are you doing here? And she's just like one of those really tough people. But she's had a, a tough surgery this time. And uh, pray for Betty. We need her and, and we love her. And uh, she has steadied the ship of this church for seven years uh, and, and kept us on our course financially and uh, pray for her to, to get back. Amber has gone to see her grandmother. They, told, they called and said, your, your grandmother has 24 to 48 hours. I have not heard from Amber since. And she just said, she just said, Pop Allen, I'm going home to kiss my grandma one more time. I'm like, you do that. I say going home, going to her home. All right, y'all ready? None of that was preaching. No, hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, Ephesians 4, so you can see if I can tell in the truth. You can go there in your own Bible. I want to talk about unity in Christ. There's a unity that we have. and It's not like other unities. We have it. It's unique. But listen, historically, it has not worked out seamlessly. And one of the reasons you have to constantly call on the church to be the church, call on the people of God to be Christians, seek after the real thing, and bind yourself again to Lord Jesus Christ is because we don't get these things right automatically. Because the cultural forces that are at work in our body, in our mind, in the, in the realm we live in, the cultural forces are very strong. In fact, they are like the course of a river. I just went and crossed the Mississippi River. There's not a human being alive who could start swimming under the Mississippi River Bridge and swim across that river and still be under the bridge when it gets to the other side. It cannot be done by a human unaided. 
And that's what life is like in the real world. The culture that you are in, the things that you're experiencing push you. And you and I, regardless of that fact, are called to certain things where we are determined to stay on our course. Unity in Christ. I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. <clears throat> Simply put, in the previous chapter, three, he says, I'm a prisoner for your sake. Here he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Both were true. Paul was a prisoner because the gospel that he preached <clears throat> created a situation that disrupted the culture. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm just going to get my throat clear. The gospel that he preached created a culture that disrupted life. The authorities, both in Ephesus and Jerusalem, when the, when, when the social discord was caused where Paul went, they didn't care what he was preaching. They cared the outcomes of what he was doing. So he said, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. Specifically, Paul's gospel preached a unity of people that was not before known. The calling to which they had been called was to be in Christ one new man, Jew and Gentile. People who are willing to eat at the same table. Nothing is harder than to get people to eat at the same table when they have food red, uh, legalisms that forbid certain foods. All of this flows from the fact that Jesus, when he inaugurated the new covenant, told a bunch of Jews to drink blood. Can't get this stuff just anywhere. And now he tells them, because of Christ, you are one new man and you're to eat. The calling to which they were called was unity in Jesus Christ. And therefore, he says, with all humility, you do this. Colleen preached a sermon on humility. I told him last night, I got mad at her because I didn't want to be humble. Y'all want to be humble? I got mad at her. But I'm smart enough to not say, Lord, I don't want to be humble, but please humble me. I'm smarter than that. <laughs> when, when God humbles you, you will wish you humbled yourself. 100%. With all humility and gentleness, you cannot engage someone that you have considered unclean or pagan. Listen, the pagans considered the Jews to be atheists because the Jews wouldn't come to the feast of the gods. The Jews considered the pagans to be defiled because of their idolatry and frankly, because of their racial identity. So with all humility and gentleness, what was happened was in Christ, a new humanity was created. A brand new humanity was created. And that's what Paul was preaching. And that's what created the pain for him. So it takes humility, gentleness, patience, it's one of those other things, that patience thing. Don't pray for that. Patience comes by tribulation. In fact, right now, we're in tribulation. We were in tribulation in the COVID crisis, and we were saying the world's never going to be the same. And all of a sudden, we got a, a dose of a cultural upheaval that we have not had the like of 
certainly since the early 90s, but I would say we haven't had it like this since the 60s. But here it is, bearing up with one another. And then he says this, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So a man who's in prison for disrupting the peace is now calling them to be peaceful. But he's also calling them to a unity of the spirit. A unity of the spirit is not like other kinds of unity. A unity of the spirit is the thing God did to enable them to do what he had called them to do. When God calls us to something, he provides for us. When God, when, when God demands something from us, he enables it in us. And so God calling us to be one new man in Christ then enables us by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's more than enabling. It's even more than that. He changes our identity. He changes our, the, the, the essence of who we are so that we can say, not I, but Christ who lives in me. I'm in union with Christ. I'm one with Christ. And the Jesus in me can meet the Jesus in you. And we are one. Now, this is a unity that you can't get by marching in the streets. I actually heard, I heard uh, one of the, I heard a, a prophetic leader in our, in our, in, in, in the church saying, what we need to have is this massive Christian march. I'm like, no, that's the last thing we need to have right now. We just need to have authentic love exchanged between people. Authentic manifestations that we are united because of something that our king has done. Do you understand we have a king? And oh, by the way, I'm going to go further. This unity, this doesn't mean, this is not, this is not a political unity. This is not a unity with, every, I'm sorry, it's not a unity with the whole world. Because make no mistake about it, the forces of this world, one of the things they want to do is stamp out our faith because we won't just say everything's all right. Now, listen to me. I am never going to say everything all right. I'm never going to get a unity that causes me to compromise uh, <laughs> a whole lot of things. I won't give you the list today. You can't bear it. But I'm not going to have a unity based on an ideology. I'm going to have a unity based on Jesus Christ. I've seen it tried both ways. And so the, the word of God says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And, oh, it was so tenuous. I said last night, and I'll say it again today, that, that um, somebody says, well, how are we going to fix this? It won't be fixed without, it won't be fixed. Nothing ever gets fixed in the world without suffering. Nothing ever gets really healed in this world without suffering. It was the suffering of Jesus that produced the body of Christ. And listen, he was not a martyr. The death of Jesus was not martyrdom. We're not united around a martyr who died for a cause. We're united around one who entered into the crisis of humanity, entered into the sin of humanity, and came in there and rescued us and did something in us and for us to create us into, into something that this world has never seen. And I'm going to tell you, it's been at work in the world. And all I ever hear is horrible reports about the church. Well, I ain't giving you one. Because the church has always been there over and again. Authentic Jesus-following Christianity has always been there. There's been plenty of messes. I suppose there'll be some more. But Christians have always been there feeding the poor, making homes for orphans, educating the uneducated, creating hospitals, creating, a, creating the possibility for people to have a better life. Christianity has always been that. And the Christian gospel has been so powerful in the United States of America that it has forced the government into cooperating with getting education for everybody, getting health care for people, 
I ain't messing around about this. I've said this for years, and now it's there on us. All right. Y'all think I'm mad, but I'm not. I'm excited. Now he says, in light of the one new man, spoken of in chapter three, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. What does it mean when you repeat yourself? Mama, why do you keep saying the same thing to your kids? You want them to get it. <laughs> I remember Papa Jack messing with me about, uh, uh, about understanding something he was saying. And I said, Papa Jack, I'm stubborn. And he said, son, I want you to know that I can adjust the sound of my voice to the thickness of your skull. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> Steve Swanson was there when it happened. I never see him since that time that he doesn't remind me about the thickness of my skull. So you need to understand something. There is a sevenfold unity spoken of by Paul because of the thickness of our skull. And because the necessity of us to, to get it. I want you to notice the way I've arranged it. Because Paul wove into it Trinitarian theology. I am an unapologetic Trinitarian. I'm a wild Trinitarian. God Father, God Son, God Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. It's, it's, it's the essence of Christianity since the beginning. Hallelujah. I'm trying to think about my side trails, whether I'm going on them. I'll probably go on this one for a minute. But don't miss it. See the one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. That's the Trinitarian aspect. And then he weaves in there one body. Because listen, we belong to each other. Like my friend Terry Harrison says when he sees me, Alan, I love you and there ain't nothing you can do about it. And I'm like, well, I'll try. One body. You dismember your body and you'll discover that it's an oops. So for Christians, the deal is this. We belong to each other and we're going to fight till we sort it out. When I married Gail, I didn't know what I was marrying. Nobody who gets married ever does. You were like, I was all excited about all this, but I wasn't really informed about all this. And you married it all. And then what do you do? You conform yourself until there's a unity and a union of persons. And I want you to know, there might be a few clashes along the way. So I still remember 1974, that morning I woke up and I looked over there and I'm like, she ain't leaving. And I thought, oh God, what have I done? <laughs> That's marriage, guys. And it's one body. So literally, Jesus has called us to a unity. So that means it transcends when we say something that hurts each other's feelings. It transcends when we make a step that's an oops. It transcends when we're stubborn with each other. There's a unity that we have that matters. I'll come back to the Trinity in a minute. The one hope. One hope. Hope for a Christian is just one thing. It's Jesus. Hope for me is not, uh, I, I hope... Uh, well, you name the list, anything. It's not, I hope it doesn't rain today. It's not, I, I hope I get a raise. It's not, I hope this encounter with somebody goes well with me. Hope is none of that. 
Hope is, my hope is in him. It's as sure as he is. It's as stable as he is. It's as fixed as he is. He is my hope. Because everything else is fading. That's what... That's what Barbara Martin told us the last time she spoke to us. One faith. One faith. The confession of the Christian is Jesus is Lord. And I will not let somebody else put their words in my mouth. Other than that, that's my confession. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord over COVID. He's Lord over what's in the streets. He's Lord over what caused the streets to get filled. He's Lord over the history. He's Lord. Oh, he's Lord. His Lordship is not contingency on who sits in Washington. In any seat. His Lordship is not contingency on any of that stuff. He's, and that's my faith. That is my faith. That is my faith. My faith is in him alone. And my baptism, hallelujah, I did a baptism. And here's where I'll come back to my Trinity thing. I did a bat. So while I was gone, man, I had so much fun, preached a couple times, had, had a lot of family time, and I baptized my niece. So she came to my sister's funeral and she said, Uncle Alan, I, I'm coming back for, for um, they, call my, they call my, the grandkids uh, call uh, my mother, well, the, the grandkids call her Muzz, and the great grandkids call her Muffin. And you can't bear the explanation for all that, but it's fun. So, so she said, We're, I'm coming back for Muzz's birthday party. Will you baptize me? I'm like, yes, I will. I saw her, I saw her uh, pastor uh, at my sister's funeral, and I asked for his permission to baptize one of his church members because I have good manners. And my familial relationship to her did not transcend the fact that she's in his ministry and I showed respect for that. I didn't hear back from that for about a week. When I heard back from that, it was, this, was, this was the fun thing he said. He said, you can baptize her if you baptize her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I was like, oh, that's, oh, that's Southern. <laughs> I was like, and, and some of you may not know the, the conflict that lies underneath a statement like that. Because most of you go like, well, what would be different? Well, it's an interesting thing. In Matthew's gospel, it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the Lord am I with you always. And um, that's the only place where it says that. You come to the book of Acts when they baptized, they baptized in the name of Jesus. And so there's a denomination that will only baptize in the name of Jesus. And they think if you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you've baptized somebody into a pagan cult. They're really strong about it. I ran into these people and uh, actually remembered, I ran into these people. Uh, <laughs> it was 1970, uh, was it 75, I think? Or, no, it wasn't. It was, uh, when did we get married? 74? It was, it was yeah, it was Hallelujah, 76. And I know it's awful that I, that I think about these things, but I do. And I ran into these guys. I worked, I worked in a Western auto warehouse. And I was working there and <laughs> ran into these guys that were, that were Jesus-only baptizers. And they started troubling me. And because I'm such a Bible guy, I went and studied the Bible and it kind of bothered me. But you know me, if you know me, I act like it don't bother me, even though it kind of bothered me. And, and ultimately, I settled on the fact that, that, that the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus is one thing. However, the same guy, I, I always torture people. The same guy, they were, they were, they, they had, they had some strange doctors. Like for instance, if you baptize somebody and their feet came out of the water, you had to baptize them again because they weren't fully baptized. These same guys, they wore long sleeve shirts only. 
And I, and I noticed, and, and, and I, I noticed in the heat of summer, these guys are wearing long sleeve shirts, but they would turn their cuff up one little turn. This is a side thing, but it's just me having fun. They would turn their cuff up one little turn. And uh, I would say, so you guys don't believe, y- y'all think that short sleeve shirts are of the devil? And he made it real plain that, they, yeah, that's what they thought. And I said, well, how many turns can you turn your cuff before you belong to the devil? <laughs> it was, in, y'all know me. He didn't have an answer. And so I wore short sleeves. <laughs> just thank God that you can't get this stuff just anywhere. So I baptized my niece in the name of God, the father, Jesus, the son, and of the Holy spirit. Covered it all, man. I've been, and y'all don't know this, but I've been doing that for years. If you know me and you come to a baptism, I've been doing that for years. We have a unity. We belong to each other. Paul's nailing it home, nailing it home, nailing it home, nailing it home. You have a unity. But I want to I wanna press one more point. Really, I'll press it right here. It's a threefold parity. That is to say, access and experience of God. Remember the text? Here's what it said. One body and one spirit, just as you were called to the hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who, which by the way, sevenfold, I like that. I always like that when I see it in scripture. Who is over all, through all, And in, I will say, you all, in you. Now, a couple things really quickly. One is, when I was teaching students this week at the Global School Online, I always, I asked that question that you've heard, some of you have heard me ask. We're talking about Saul and David, and I said, Do you want Saul's anointed or David's anointed? And then I go quiet. Because people think about that. And some people just automatically say, oh, I want David's anointing. And then I say to them, it's the same anointing. It's exactly the same anointing. Saul received exactly what David received. They were kings anointed by the spirit to be submitted to a sovereign Lord who was over all. The difference in David and Saul was Saul actually thought he was king and David knew God was king. That's a big difference. But it was the same anointing. What this parody that I'm saying, God and father of all who is over all, through all and in all. Here's what this means. It means every one of us have the same access to God. Not all of us walk it out the same. This is why people see Randy Clark and they say, I want his anointing. And I'm pretty stubborn because I say, I'm happy for him to lay his hands on me, but I already have an anointing from the Holy One. Anointing, it simply means the gift of Holy Spirit imparted to you. Now, now, Randy Clark has a special gifting and calling on his life. And a lot of people, what they mean when they say, I want his anointing, they want his gifting. That's fine, go after that. But it's the same spirit. The spirit operates in many gifts. It's the same Lord. It's the same God. And so I'm going to tell you, one of the things that we have to learn is the biggest limit on our life is us, not him. And that's why we press in all the time. That's why we don't stop pressing in. But I have to, I'm not finished yet with this. I'm going to say too much of it. Hallelujah. It's the unity of the spirit. All right. The Holy Spirit is the only, 
No one and nothing but Holy Spirit can create in the body of Christ the unity that we have sometimes lacked but Holy Spirit. You will not create a unity among the body of Christ by an ideology or a scheme or a plan. And I've seen it tried. I'm going to talk to you further in future messages about why I have been talking to you about issues of of ideologies in the past. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why, probably even next week. But for today, what I want to see is when you see Holy Spirit unity, it is altogether different than when you see a unity that is called for by a political motivation or an ideological motivation. The unity of the Spirit. When it comes to the races, that's always been a big problem. But God did something amazing in 1904 when he poured out his Spirit over, through, and in a black man And a revival was fomented that has had iterations of itself in the last 115 years that have gone on and on and on and created a bond of love between people of other races that is in Jesus, in the spirit, and it's unbreakable. And that's what I'm after. Hallelujah. Words matter. I've been harping on that for so many years. And there's never been a time, there's never been a time in our experience when we need to define our words more than now. So if you hear me something, say something, and you're wondering, what is it he's saying by that? You should ask me in the same way that last week you were, you were invited to ask questions. I'll do it. But I have discovered that one of the things that I'm going to have to do is to get very vigorous about clearly defining what I'm talking about when I say ideologies. I have been clear in the past, but the truth is this. Many times I have come home after preaching sermons where I have talked about those overarching themes and I have said to Gail, they don't understand me. They have a sense of what I'm saying and they, and you understand me in, in various degrees. But I have been talking about what our culture is going through right now. I did not expect it to come with such a wave of, of force. Hallelujah. And so during this time, it'll be important. It'll be, it'll be necessary for definition of terms. Y'all are getting a little more than they got last night. I didn't go as forcefully into that. But I'm going to do it. But I'm going to do it. But listen, I know what I'm after. I'm after the unity of the Spirit. I'm after a thing that Holy Spirit creates in us. It was not until Jesus came into my life that I began to understand in my cultural moorings as a Mississippian in the 1960s and then into the early 70s when Jesus touched me that I began to look and see there's something wrong with what I've been thinking And it was then that God began to create a bond where there had been a barrier. I know about the middle wall of partition. I lived in it in the Jim Crow South. I know about Jesus by his spirit breaking down the middle wall of partition that Paul was speaking of in the temple and in the synagogue. It existed in both places. And the 
upheaval that comes when that is disrupted. So here we are. And here we go. I'm going to read the rest of the text to you, and then I'm going to come back and preach it next week. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Oh, I love this. Therefore, it says, that is the scriptures, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Uh, I'm going to have to unpack that psalm for you. I don't have time to do it today. This is one of those curious passages that we read and we say, what does he mean? So next week, I'll unpack it for you. In fact, I'll probably start right here in this text. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions. I just had two of my systematic theology students write papers for me about the descending of Christ. To the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Jesus ascended, seated on the throne, reigning, filling all things. Jesus, the one we call Lord, gloriously risen, gloriously over all. Jesus, the one who gives us our identity, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, the one who knows us, the one who creates a new humanity and ultimately a new creation. The one who fills all things. See, what's coming next is what we usually preach about, and I might actually have to, ooh, even as I'm standing here, I'm like, there might be three more sermons just in the chapter four. And he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to what? What? Have you noticed that he hasn't changed his subject? Paul started off in this passage talking about unity. In the third chapter, he talked about one new man. He parsed out this unity, and now he says, I want you to have unity. <laughs> we say, well, this is impossible. It's impossible if we do it the way we've been doing it. Till we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be ch children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by the craftiness and deceitful schemes. I want you to know that right now in the public sphere, there's more human cunning and craftiness and schemes than there has been in my lifetime. And social media has created a platform for crafty cunningness of men to fill our minds and deceitful schemes to fill our minds. I'm going to be talking about it. Okay. I gave you, I gave you a, a sevenfold unity, a threefold parody, and a fivefold ministry. And here's the, the fivefold ministry in Scripture. He gave apostles. Now listen, let me tell you something. So you, a few things that you understand how I, do not get it in your head that every one of us is one of these five. It's not true. What is true is each of these five categories are people, actual people that are given to the church for the purposes that they were named. For those purposes. And it's interesting Apostles are named 25 times, and I said one of them is a woman. People dispute that, but that's, I've preached on it already. I've, uh, I've preached through a, a, a concept of a book called Junia is Not Alone. Prophets, nine of them are named in the New Testament. These are New Testament. 
evangelist. One is named. Who is it? Philip. Pastors, zero are named. The word we use the most. Teachers, five are named. So the fivefold ministry, and listen, it's functional, not positional. I have, we've all made the mistakes of giving people titles. Almost always when you give somebody a title, it messes up the function. This, and I, I've, had to, I've had to get hold of this. I've had to get hold of this. This has been hard for me. Even like in the Baptist church, when you said to somebody, you're a deacon, and you gave them a positional title of a deacon, it turned them from servants into rulers and messed it up. In fivefold ministry, charismatic churches, when you, when you take the fivefold ministry and you turn it into positions uh, rather than functions, you mess it up for the whole body. You mess it up for everybody. It's something that gets done. And I, I've always wanted more fivefold ministry, but, but so far, every time I go for it, I mess it up. Me. Just saying. And there's the statement again of what it's for. And then here's where I'm, where I'm headed. It's for the restoration of the saints, and here's where I'm headed. Maturity, Christ-likeness, or childlikeness. Unfortunately, this childlikeness is not the, the kind of childlikeness that Jesus talks about when you become like a child. This is more like childishness. And that's where we're going. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is where I'm going in the coming weeks. My wife was getting nervous because I was going on and on. I had such a wonderful encounter while I was teaching online. I never dreamed such a thing could happen. I was teaching this week the Global uh, Summer Institute where I've, I've taught. Uh, they've had me as the, as the um, last two-day teacher. They've had me that for, I don't know, years now. I don't know. And I love it so much. And what happened to me was I'm teaching about these things and the Holy Spirit fell on me while I'm teaching on Zoom. I just made a mess of me. Why? Because here's, here's, here's the thing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Get ready to take the supper. Just get yourself ready to take the supper. wretched man that I am. Hallelujah. Charlie, I wanted the youth to come up. I asked, I asked the youth to come up. I told them just reprise one of their gifts to us. But please be ready to take the supper with us before we do. If you don't have the elements, somebody bring them the elements. Let's be sure. If you don't have the elements, I want to be sure. Who, who needs the elements of the supper? Over here, Billy needs them. Right down here. Brad needs them. Billy over here. Oh, Brad, Brad's got it. Somebody needs to sit with Brad and help him with the, with the opening. Okay. All right. Jesus. Yeah, I don't think I need to say what I'm, what I'm what's, I don't need, I don't need to say it. I don't need to say it. I need, I... Listen, when the Holy Spirit starts to do something with you, don't quench it. Don't quench it. You know, I'll confess to you that, that in these days, I've had all the emotions that everybody's had, the fear, the frustration, the anger, the desire to fight, the desire to quit, 
I've, every, every one of those things have come like waves across my soul. And, and it, some of you haven't had that, and I honor that. But for me, it's been like every, it, it's literally, when I read the book of Revelation, they opened the abyss and out swarmed this swarm of demonic powers. I'm like, that seems like this. It seems like what we're in. It seems like an assault of demonic darkness. And every time, the only thing that brings me through is the conscious experience of the presence of God. So like, listen, like I told you, don't ask God to humble you, but I'll tell you this, in the presence, humility is always there. In the presence. We've come to where we, we, we receive the presence. This is so beautiful. I want you to know what I think the Lord's doing in our church. We have so magnified the laying on of hands and the impartation. And now we're in a situation where that is both um, potentially dangerous and divisive. And so we have laid it aside. And we've, lit, we've literally done that. And then the Lord, what he's done for us at this church is he's brought us to the bread and the cup. Because, because what we have been striving to receive through impartation of hands he has always made available to us through the receiving of the body and the blood. The one who incarnated himself in flesh became one of us and now has ascended into his glory, but he gives us um, material means to encounter his presence. And so I invite you to receive the impartation of the presence of Jesus in the bread and in the cup. And to realize this is what creates us the one new man because it's one table. New creation. We eat at one table. And so, the body of Christ is given to us. Jesus, we thank you. We bless this bread. We call it holy. We say we know that we are receiving you again. Your healing, your presence, your love. The body of Christ is given for us, church. Until this day, I had never considered how that Jesus used the Passover meal and the cup to prepare his disciples to come to one table with pagans. Because Jesus invited his disciples to do something they had never done, to receive blood. It was the perfect preparation that they would sit with others. And so the blood of Christ is the forgiveness of our sins. The blood of Christ is the shattering of the veil that separated us from God. The blood of Christ is the shattering of the wall of partition that divided us from our brothers and sisters. The blood of Christ creates the one new humanity. And so I say, the blood of Christ. Jesus, we thank you. We bless this cup. The blood of Christ is shed for us. Fill us. Thank you.